Welcome to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The key to getting the most out of the seminar series is to listen to the small things, the subtle adjustments our faculty teams adhere to when the fishing might be tough or they're trying to target trophy game fish. That's what we call the gold nuggets of the seminar series. So come with me, let's get right to it and join, in progress, the Saltwater Sports and the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The topic will be snook, and we have some definite snook heavyweights sitting here. We have Mike Goodwine from the Tampa Bay area, and I fished with him before on Stook, and I can attest he's got their numbers figured out. We have Debbie Hansen out of the Fort Myers area, an inshore fishing specialist and also an ardent Stook angler. Then we have Crazy Alberto Knee. I like to refer to him from parts unknown because this guy is everywhere from Fort Myers to our side of the South Florida coast all the way up. So it's going to be really intriguing, and I want to sort of break this down between working live baits and artificials, but then I want to save the backside of this to actually trolling for snook, which is a good way to get some of the true classic heavyweights. So we're going to start this off because I know we definitely have sort of a controversial crew here split between live baiting and also artificial lures. So Mike, you're an ardent live baiter. We fished. You like live chumming. I don't even think you have an artificial lure on your boat. Again, <laughs> no. why live bait for snook? I like live bait because I'm trying to catch fish. <laughs> That's it. And I'm trying to do as less work as I can. Nothing against these strange people over here that I like to use all <laughs> Wait a minute, fish. less work. Think about the time you spent throwing that cast net for that bait. Yeah, because I know how to throw a cast net, and <laughs> that's another reason. That's why people use artificial, because they don't know how to throw a cast net. That's my take, so I'm hey, just hey, trying to make my job easy. Hey, that's Mike, it. Mike, Mike, look at me. Look at me. What happens if there's no bait? What do you do? Then I reschedule the trip. <laughs> that's just it. Then you use lure. <laughs> Where is the habitat different that you're searching for around these mangroves, are points. Give us some of the ideas of what you're looking for. Okay, in, in Tampa Bay, we have passes inside the mangrove. So you have a mangrove line, and each mangrove line have a pass that take you to the bike country. And usually that pass will have a deep hole somewhere near the mangroves. Almost every single one of them has a deep hole. Does this tend to be more near the mouth, or could that be back it's in there? It's at more? the mouth. It's okay. always at the mouth. And um, uh, so those snook, unlike the the redfish, the snook will hang out in those in those holes. They won't hang up under the mangroves. Every now and then you get some from under the mangroves, but nine times out of ten in Tampa Bay they're gonna be in the deep holes in the passes. So what we'll do is we'll pull up and each pass right now, especially during the winter time, you could pull up to one of those deep pockets right before the mangroves start and chum bait and catch all the snook you want. And we, we run a bunch of tower boats in Tampa Bay. And you can look down and just count the snook. And uh, on a good day or on an average day, you could see the snook two to three feet from your bait, from your boat, just sitting up there looking, waiting for you the drop of bait off. You, you, you got them trained like we have Florida Keys Yellowtail train on that. All right, Debbie, you're, you're farther south. You're representative of Southwest Florida. Yep. Okay, and uh, as far as, and you're an artificial. And, and when it comes to that, do you like subsurface baits? Do you like topwater baits? Tell me a little bit about your specialty and what would be the right conditions where you would apply that? So topwater generally, again, fishing early in the morning, later in the evening, um, overcast days primarily, and I'm looking for those troughs that are running along the mangrove that are basically like fish highways. Those deeper troughs right off the edge of the mangrove. Bait, structure, current, three primary ingredients that I'm always looking for when I'm out there snook fishing. And again, this, you know, the thing is, is you really want to make sure that you're you're maintaining that consistent action when you're working that top water lure and 
you, you're always looking for those ambush points. I mean, snook are an ambush predator, and when they come up and blow up on that top water, be ready, because they're not like a redfish, which is like, you know, a Ford F-150 that's just gonna go and run. It's a, I mean, a snook is a Ferrari that's gonna take off. It's gonna wind you around those, you know, hairpin turns, the mangrove branches. I mean, it's gonna, it has a plan when it gets hooked, so. I like Corvettes personally, but I'm not gonna let that get into our, our discussion here. But let, let, real quick, Nate, now, when you're throwing top water, what, what is your go-to top water bait? And real quick, give me the colors that make a difference and tell me about the terminal arrangement. What pound test leader? This is it right here. So I'm using 30 pound monofilament leader and I'm using the Rapala skitter walk right here. Um, it's weighted in the back end of it. So it gets that really fantastic yep. walk the dog motion. And it's got a little bit of a rattle in it too, which also helps to attract the attention of the yep. fish. And uh, yeah, it's just keeping that consistent cadence is so, so important. Even when you see that weight coming up behind the bait, do not break the cadence because the fish will lose interest. It'll turn off of that lure and you're not going to get the strike. All right. And when you're working at around the mangroves, you, obviously you're trying to get that as close to those mangroves, if you could, up underneath where, where that zone is going to be. Absolutely, and it's going to make a difference. Your casting accuracy makes such a big difference. I mean, you know, one foot, you know, even a few inches, you want to be right up against the edge of those mangroves to give it a more realistic, natural presentation. That's where all those bait fish are going to be up in there trying to get away from those yep. big snook. So the closer you can get it to the edge of the mangrove line, the better off you're going to be. Uh, and before we turn it over to Crazy Alberto, because I know he has some definite bizarre tactics, we're going to take a commercial break. So we're going to take a uh, quick break, sell some uh, sponsors product, and the Saltwater Sportsman Magazine will resume with Snook Panel after a few minutes. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. And let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. But Alberto, let's go back to you. You hear Mike, Mr. Libate. You hear Miss America over there, how she likes her artificials <laughs> for snook. You knock out big snook and you do a terrific job. What are you doing differently than these two? Well, fortunately, I don't have the luxury to have pets like what Mike said. <laughs> uh, you know, you feed them, fatten them up, and here come, come on, fishy. But for, for the better part, yeah, I mean, these fish are opportunistic feeders. The common denominator, I mean, you're spot on. It has a lot to do with presentation. Yes, they do eat bait, but I like the hunt. I like that big fish hunt. I like that one big fish at a time, and we're looking at the snookzilla, if you will. I'm it's only one kind of snook, though, and that's a cult snook. So, oh, yeah. Do, well, <laughs> <laughs> for me, it is. You use a lot of bait, then it'd be one for you, too. Well, I'm an, well you gotta remember, I'm an opportunistic <laughs> fisherman. I have to look at the water conditions. If the water is clear, if the wind is, is right, the, the tide situation is ideal. Don't give me that funny look, George. Oh, oh I'm, I'm like it. I'm <laughs> with you. I'd rather spend all day or all night for that one big one. Oh yeah. And there is definitely a pattern. Where I come from, we call it inlets. Inlets, highways, and they, they all love structure. Big fish, understandably, they come from big waters. Inlets, highways, ocean fronts, jetties, big bridges, and they are one thing that we cannot forget. These are nocturnal fish. Mm -hmm. Nocturnal big fish. Which I'm going to hold you on because I want to come back because you, you had covered everything to the T. But we talked, you mentioned docks in there too. Now, the bigger snook tend to be more around the lit up docks yes. that are near an area where you got a good amount of water flow. And even during the daytime, because if that dock is lit every night, the bait fish get in the habit of coming around and these big snook are a little bit more on the prowl. So it's docks with the water, you know, but, but, but go on. And I want to, get you to a little bit on, on catching fish in the inlets. Now, tides play a very important role. Could you narrow it down to certain tide stages when somebody should be in an inlet trying for big snook? For, all right, there's 
four tides in, on the East Coast snook. You have the incoming tide and the outgoing tide. You have the daytime and you have the nighttime. I like to catch them in nighttime because less pressure, you're like the, um, the angler, it's just you and the fish. That, that's old school snooking, by the way. Hypothetically, let's just say there's six part of the one part of the tide, uh, one tide. The first hour and the last hour of the nearest slack or after the slack, all right, that's your magical window, all right? When you know that near slack, because these big fish do not get big for being stupid, big fat, because they just want that big fish, the big bait, and they move on and um, near water. And let me tell you, I don't fool around. When it comes to bait, it's got to be a big bait. Give them what they want. Big fish, big bait. And then if the water is dirty, Mike, sometimes I don't, you know, I go with different color. Or sometimes you need to look real. You go as natural as this. Or you can just go catch some bait. If you can't catch it, you can buy it. However, <laughs> just use real bait. <laughs> then you don't eat all that. Well, just the key saying. thing is, you, you know, I could go be at a specific time and I don't have to worry about catching that bait. Well, I, because let, bait let, is, let, there's let, a lot of I'm gonna jump in this bait yeah. artificial uh, debate here for a second here. Let's get to the brass tacks. Now you're targeting the bigger snook. So let's talk about the pound test leader, mono versus fluorocarbon, okay. the size or style of hook that you're using. Again, you're targeting a bigger snook here. So let's try to get a real cliff note version here. Or I go shoot with it a, right out. Uh, excellent question. I go with a bare minimum of 50 braid with 80 to 100 shock liter fluorocarbon. Right, so you, you're definitely stepping up to the 100 pound for that. Oh yeah, because you know what? The day that you use the 60 pound, you, you throw that lure and boom, when she's screaming, and all of a sudden you know she's gonna go to that kitchen where the knives are, hence being the barnacles, and they, they'll pop it. A hundred pound test fluorocarbon, that is the most abrasion resistant line that you could ever use. All right, take me down to the hook. Are you using uh, 1X strong or are you using 2X strong? 4X. You're using the 4X, so oh, you're, I don't you're fool just around. trying to put the heat to it and stop it. Absolutely. That's what you got to do in yeah. a lot of cases there. And the, for, for the better part, those are the big fish, you know, and it's, it's about the sport, big yep. tackle. Get on the boat, get on the boat, get them. on the shore, get on the beach, get no on the doubt. suds. Take a quick shot and let her go. I uh, gotcha. And we're gonna take a quick commercial break and we're gonna come back and I wanna talk about actually trolling up snook in inlets and around bridges too. So the Saltwater Sports and the National Seminar Series will resume in a few minutes. Don't go far, a lot of good information coming up. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. And we're in the thick of our snook session here. Crazy Alberto with his uh, lures, Debbie Hanson with her artificials, or driving Mike Goodwine, our live baiting pro, absolutely <laughs> berserk. But he's been a good sport about it. So let me throw something in the mix here. That is, uh, you know, I'm going to credit this. I'll probably get a lot of hate emails, but it's a South Florida standard we grew up doing. That is trolling, swimming plugs for snook, and it's an outstanding way to catch big snook. All right, take. My hometown inlet, for example, you got a haul over inlet, could be 15, 18, some odd feet deep. And trolling a Rapala CD18 with either 80 or 100 pound test fluorocarbon leader is absolutely deadly when these snook are stacking up around the stanchions of the bridge or even down towards the mouth around the jetties. You drive that boat out and it takes a 20 pound class spinning outfit or a conventional uh, 20 or 30 pound test braid, 30 pound test braid, 832 suffix is great. And then from there you have a little bit of your swivel, barrel swivel, the leader and the plug. You let that plug out, you keep pausing it to make it dig deep and you let it out far enough to where you actually feel it bump bottom, take it up two or three turns. When you're trolling, keep the rod tip at the water surface and you troll. 
you know, with the with the, the short bridges, you troll underneath the bridges, go all the way up, clear, reel the plug up, turn around, and do it the opposite way out to the inlet. A lot of times you can hook up under the bridge, and when you do, the most important person at that point in time is the boat operator. Keep the boat moving forward, don't stop. That still could be trying to dig, get by the uh, groins, and it, it's really amazing to look that you catch. For longer span bridges in the bays, especially the ones that are lit up at night near an inlet, you go down to the uh, CD15 or with the shallow running rapid plugs, same deal, troll along the shadow lines at night, you try the up current side and the down current side, you're covering ground, you're covering stations, and they jump on those plugs like it's going out of style. So, I mean, I have to agree with you because at nighttime particularly, uh, I use shadow line a lot. And it has a lot to do with the right column, the water column, because they're not going to go up that high to chase that bait, especially the bigger one. They want very close to the structure. And it's all about that sweep and how you swim it. I mean, that's spot on. I love there it. Is. And the thing is with these snook is to make sure when you work a plug to get it deep enough. Some right. people, they have it three feet under the surface. You want to keep dropping back, raw tip at the water, bump bottom, and then bring it up a few turns. This way you always know. And, and depending on what the tide's doing, sometimes you have to let out more to reach the bottom than going the opposite way. Now, Mike, uh, Alberto's talking shadow lines. Do you do much night fishing at all? No, I don't do no night fishing. Every time I try the night fish, and usually the night fishing is around docks. Right. Where they have the lights with the fish on it. Seem like every time I try to catch fish there, they call the police on me. So <laughs> I don't know what it is, but so I don't do no night fishing. But uh and and just a moment of truth, like I'm teaching, but I am so as am a student too, because I've never trolled the snook like that. So I just learned something. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. Stay cool and protected while fishing. Calcutta Outdoors, hard-working outdoor gear. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West. Visit flakeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the final installment of the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. It is, and, and especially the bridges you have over your part of the world, oh, yeah. it's just a matter of getting the right wrap low with the, with the depth that's going to take you where you need to be. And it could be one rod, one person on a rod, and just pick away at the snook. Can you troll a big piece of cut bait? Or? Well, you can let us know. The next time we do a snook session, you can let us know about yes. that. And, and as, far as, try. as far as I know, you could be live chumming behind the boat as we're trolling and bring them all up to the top. You get them on a top water plug. I think water temperature too is so key oh, yes. when you're snook fishing. All right, well, 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 which is crude. Tell me that, and I want to ask you, what happens after a cold front when you snook get lethargic? What do you do retrieve-wise? But fill us in on this. You gotta slow everything down after a cold front, but for sure, water temperature wise, a snook's preferred water temperature range is gonna be anywhere from about 70 to 82 degrees. And you know, those fish, basically that's when they're gonna be the most active. That's when they're gonna be aggressively chasing baits and pursuing any type of lure that you're throwing out there or live bait if you're cheating. Mm -hmm. I, mean, you're, <laughs> I mean, Debbie, you're spot on. And, and yeah. honestly, in the winter months, right now, we just went through a series of cold fronts. Anything that you can do as far as getting up into those areas where even maybe a few degrees of a temperature increase is gonna make a huge difference in terms of you finding those fish. So you're going up in the rivers, you're going up in the creeks, and you're looking for springs, you're looking for dark bottom. That's where those bigger snook are gonna be during the colder winter months of the year here in Florida, and yeah. specifically where I fish around Estero Bay, Hendry Creek, um, Spring Creek, those areas. And to touch on what she said, seawalls too, because it holds heat. They'll get up against the seawall because it holds heat too, so. And not only that, but when, I mean, you're spot on. When the water is cold, they get very lethargic, all right? The best way to actually get that bite is playing dirty what Mike does, give them bait. Well, and I'll throw one more boomerang, which favors Mike's side here, <clears throat> is when we were growing up, this old guy that lived next door to my cousin would take a rod, he'd snag some mullet, and he would go ahead inside, you know, Biscayne Bay. It was a canal that would go into uh, the Ulita in Mall Lake in that area. He would just throw a half a fresh mullet on the bottom with a wire leader. 
Hmm. Okay, a, a, an 80 pound single strand wire leader with a big long shank seven odd hook with an egg sinker at the end of the barrel swivel on, on the mono line. And he would bang these huge snook. Mm -hmm. And he was just old school and why using wire? Because it's tannic water. The wire lays down and it, it, it blends in there and these snook want the fresh mullet. You gotta snag him in the canal. I've seen him bring in snook 30, 35, 38. The biggest one he had, which would have been an IGFA record at the time, saw it in the scale, he didn't care about that was 53 pounds. Mm. So anyway, just to sort of leave wow. you on that note about just soaking a dead bait too, goes a big way to snook. And unfortunately, we're out of time on that one already. So what a great exchange. I appreciate the panel, Debbie, Crazy Alberto, and then Mike. And uh, we're gonna wrap this one up. But yet, yeah, stay tuned because we have more Saltwater Sports and National Seminar Series topics in the very near future. Well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Now, adhering to Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series tradition, you still have chances to win door price drawings. Simply go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door price page, just give us your name, phone number, and an email address, and at the conclusion of the airing of the series in December, we will draw for a number of excellent door prizes. Get right to it. We'll see you on the next episode of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series.